The Gateway to the West, Cardinal Nation. St. Louis, Missouri is the home to some of the most brilliant physicians in the world. These doctors are pushing science to its limits, healing patients in new, innovative ways, and doing it at the same time they're teaching the next generation of doctors how to save lives. Meet Dr. Watson, a Slucare orthopedic surgeon who helped design an innovative piece of equipment that can grow bone for patients. Dr. Greenberg, a Slucare orthopedic oncologist, just successfully performed one of the most difficult surgeries with the help of 3D printing. And Dr. Pottier, a Slucare orthopedic surgeon who during surgery developed a new innovative way to treat a neck injury to keep his patient from being paralyzed. This is the science of healing. Father's Day actually is about 7 p.m. Me and my two boys were swimming uh, alongside with my two neighbor boys. Uh, one of the boys was like, hey, y'all wanna do a watermelon dive? And I'm like, sure, well, what is it? Oh, well, it's where you dive in head first and your hands are down by your, your legs. And I'm like, okay, yeah, no problem. Four foot pull, I know, I get it. Six, over six foot tall. No big deal, right? Normally dive, no issue. As I get out of the pool, I'm getting ready to dive and my youngest son, uh, six years old, uh, jumps in. And all I'm thinking as, as I'm diving is, oh crap, I'm gonna land on him. So my mindset was uh, just try to get up and get up over him so I don't land on him. And so the moment I did, I literally just put myself at a bad angle where I was just like that. So as soon as I landed in the pool, it was just straight head to the ground. And immediately I knew it just, I tried three times to get above water, so I'm just like, you know, uh, uh. And finally, like the third time, I was able to just get my head above water enough to just yell, help, help. And so my wife jumps in and she grabs me and she's like, are you joking? Are you serious? And I'm like, I'm serious, my neck, my neck. They, air, they ambulanced me to St. Francis and then air evac me to SLU. He ended up having a fracture dislocation for himself. He was very fortunate that at that point he did not have like a complete spinal cord injury but that brings the onus on me because I have to fix it making sure that we do not lose what he already has, right? So the moment I got into the room, I mean, just, I mean they were there, they were waiting and when I got in the room there was just people just, you know, not into nothing. So it was an interesting case to begin with because we had to plan like we had to have like plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. Because it's complex, nothing goes as per plans. Because the spinal cord is very, very sensitive. You have to make sure that you do the case in such a way that it's safe. So we planned for the case and then we planned for like, try to go from the front to stabilize his, his neck. We could see his spinal cord like right, on, right, right at our face. So we were trying to reduce it, we could not reduce it. At, so plan A did not work. But then we had a plan B, which was more innovative and not the routine way of fixing the spine. So we did like a corpectomy. What we do is like we take the complete bone out on one of the levels and then it was at an angle. So we had to put a cage inside is what we do to keep the two bones from falling apart. That cage was kept in a, such an angle that once we go from the back, it should fall back in place with a perfect alignment. So I don't have to go back inside, which is a unique way of doing it. So I'm resting on, on my old experiences on based on how I would expect things will fall once we go from behind. And then we put a small plate, which is not a routine thing. So I, I wanted to put a small plate so that the case does not fall down. So we went from behind, we reduced it and everything aligned perfectly as we, as we wanted it to. At the same time, making sure that the spinal cord was completely free of compression and making sure that he does not get any spinal cord in injury. Dr. Potier, after his surgery, pulled me into a conference room and I lost it because he said he's going to be fine. And that's the only words I wanted to hear. But he was very, um, very thorough and said everything went great, which huge weight off my shoulders. He was, he was really great. The first thing I, once he woke up, I wanted to ask him like, do you move your hands, your legs? And he was like, doc, yes, it's all good job, well done. I was so happy. So overall, 
it, it's a daunting task from my side is to talk to the family with this traumatic spinal cord injuries, right? So it's, it's not just me doing everything, it's a teamwork that we do. So every person in the OR is very important at that point. I knew I was in good hands when I came to SLU. I, I, after surgery eight hours, I spent three days in ICU. Uh, literally after three days in ICU, I went straight home. And they were all amazed. Like Dr. Pade is like, he, he kept calling me Superman. And that's what keeps me going. That's what makes me thrive to get into better and better every time. So every case teaches me so many things. And then every time I see to it that it's, I give the best possible care from my side. A lot of people that had what I had would not be walking today. And I mean, it's, it's true. I know several people, whether it be C6 or C7, and they're paralyzed. So his injury was in his neck, so he would have lost all motor and sensation and bowel bladder functions completely. So he would have ended up completely paralyzed from his neck down. To me, that was the best thing that could have ever happened, is me to come up to SLU. I literally got to be there for my kids, for my family, throughout everything. I mean, minus the, the, the four, three, four days I was in the hospital. Other than that, I was home. I mean, on the baseball field in a hard collar. So surgery here, surgery at SLU, just everything about SLU is awesome. It's like a pat on my back. <laughs> saying that job well done, you know, and it keeps me going for more and more. So trying to take up more challenging cases because we see all, all sort of challenging cases here. Padier was awesome. I have nothing but praise to say about Padier. Uh, I say, call me Superman. Every time he'd walk in, I'd, you know, get the fist bumping. You know. So I follow them up to two years, which most of the dogs do not do. Once it's healed, like you're on your own. But I want to see them up to two years, right? Because I want to make sure that things are going as what we expected it to go. It's not just the patient, it's his family revolving around it as well, right? He's like a young dad, he has to play with his kids, he has to, and I have to make sure that we are going in the right path so that he can live his life as he was living before. And most patients tend to come, sometimes patients tend to come to me just to have a chat with me. Even if I say that, oh, you, you don't need to come, but they're like, oh, doc, we want to meet you. And it, they, they become like the family becomes my family as well, right? So it gives me good pleasure in doing that. I, I couldn't imagine not being there for my, my kids, my wife, my family. I do so much with them. I mean, literally coach them all year. It was in my mind, I got to do this for them, right? I mean, got to be there for them. Uh, couldn't imagine not. So I think he's going to live his life as if he should have lived without that accident. So that's my goal to make sure that he lives it. And I think he will do it. He's almost past one year and he's doing great. And I'm expecting that will continue. <laughs> he's awesome. I mean, look what he did. <laughs> I mean, he fixed his neck. He's able to still be my husband, be a dad, coach sports. I mean, he's up here. I mean, there's God and then Pottier. <laughs> I mean, he's phenomenal. I mean, we even have a friend from Cape that he did his surgery to, and he's just like my husband back on his feet riding bikes and he's great. I think the way we put the cage in with the smaller pit was the innovative part which is not normally described. So we are planning to at some point describe it if I have enough number of similar cases which is hard to find. So these are like unique cases where we once in a while we find these kind of cases. Right? It's a unique technique, it's not been described before. I had actually been in pain for, for several years and wasn't taking it seriously. She came into the clinic with, with this large mass and this, this chronic pain and this, something going on in her abdomen, as she told me. So I met her that day in clinic. I'll never forget meeting her and looking at her study. They, they came in and proceeded to tell me that they had found a large mass that they believed to be cancer. It was paralyzing. There's really no words for how you feel when you find out something like that. So this is the pelvic model, and Sam's tumor came from what we call the iliac wing. So in the pelvis, you're kind of sitting like here, here's your spine and your hip joints are here. And her tumor was sitting all in this area coming out and kind of pushing towards the center of her body, moving all the in insides, the visceral organs, like the bladder and all those things and the art the A order and things out of the way. So we basically had to remove this entire portion 
and try to save her hip joint and her spine in the back. It doesn't really feel real. And it, it's painful to see life continue to go on when, when it feels like your life has stopped. In the world of orthopedic oncology, I think if you speak to any ortho-oncologist, uh, we would all say the same thing, which is pelvic resections, which is what this is, the resection of a cancer from the pelvis are the most complicated operations we do. It's a very rare surgery. There's not a lot of information about it. It's hard to find other people that have gone through it. So you're trying to make a cut in the back of her pelvis where there's a spine and there's you know, the nerves and all these other structures and vessels and so forth. And in the front, you have a joint. And don't forget, this is in a living person, and so it's not here in the saw bones. So making those cuts with that large soft tissue component sitting here, pressing on the vessels and the all those other structures can be a very challenging, and in Sam's case, was a very challenging situation. I was referred to him by another physician because he was the only person qualified with the, the, the expertise and the knowledge to be able to take care of something as, as, as complicated and as advanced as the cancer that I had. You know, if I do the most functionally important uh, operation and Sam has great function, but I left cancer behind, that doesn't help her. To be a part of such an innovative surgery was surreal. It was just uh, petrifying. Uh, but at this, I mean, looking back today, I feel so blessed to be a part of that and grateful that there's people in this world that have the ability to do something so grand. Her goal, she wanted to survive. She had a young daughter and what she asked me for, she wanted to be around for her daughter. So for that, I said, so how do we get at this out? And so there are companies, in this case, it was Onco's, you know, that I don't have any affiliation with, they're a tumor company that provides, whether it's the implant or in their, this case, they can really do 3D printed custom devices that allow me to do the osteotomies, which are the bony cuts, very precisely to try to minimize the complications. Doesn't eliminate it, but it potentially uh, helps minimize the, the potential for them. So I ended up for her, in her situation, printing, having them print specific cutting jigs that'll actually allow me to make the cut in the back and the cut in the front precisely that are fit for her. So they basically, we spent a lot of time, the engineer and I, going over her imaging, formulating the cuts, des describing where I can go, where I can't go, how I can do this in the operating room and not, and, and putting that all together so ultimately we were able to make those cuts. So they literally took her anatomy, they took her imaging, they made it specific implants for her, they 3D printed them, and then I was able to use those implants as we showed on the slides in the PowerPoint, as I showed, I use those to make those cuts. It went extremely well, extremely, extremely well. I could not be more thankful to God for the, the doctors that I had. Ultimately, as the ortho-oncologist, I'm, I'm blessed with having partners and colleagues at, at SLU who really can help me do these complex operations. So I was around the spine. So when I'm working around the spine, a spine surgeon's helpful. So Dr. Howard Place, who's one of my partners, I said, Howard, come on, I can use your help on this. I actually literally were working around the aorta because the tumor was so large, it was pressing on the aorta. I, so I called my, I call her my BFF because in the OR, she's really my security blanket a lot of times. Dr. Kate Wicken is the vascular surgeon. So I called Dr. Wicken. I said, Kate, I need you to come help me with me. So I had, I had some resources, in this case, Dr. Wicken and Dr. Place to facilitate. And Dr. Place and I, so Howard and I said, Let's make sure we do this right. We're getting these special implants designed. We're putting we're putting Sam through this. We want to get the margins right. So we actually went out to the we uh, went to the cadaver lab and we kind of planned our cuts and we worked together and coordinated what we wanted to do. So everyone knew who who they were doing and what they were doing at the time and that role. And we practiced it. So when we got to the operating room, we kind of were pretty much set up to go. And we had the company provided the implants, and so we went from there. I told Greenberg that I was going to walk again, even if it meant God was going to carry me. Uh, as a young woman with, uh, with a young child, 
it was extremely important to me. I have always lived a very active lifestyle. Um, I've always been very physical. I don't think anyone fully comprehends how big of a part of their life walking is until the fear of not having that or not being able to is, is presented. If you look on the back, and it gets, it's hard to appreciate without all the MRIs and the imaging, but if you imagine these holes are where your nerve roots run, and over here is where a lot of the blood vessels run. So you basically had this tiny little window that I had to cut through with this big tumor sitting in the front. So we're talking millimeters off. If we're a millimeter, or if our angles are off, we're going into the tumor or we're going into nerves. So to do that, without those in without that precise cutting guide and without knowing where you're going it'd be really challenging uh, there is a special place in my heart for him uh, that will always be there and for all of the doctors uh, that saved my life i would send anyone that i loved and cared about that's that's where i would tell them to go she recovered remarkably quickly she's you know, she's out there walking with, you know, this, with this migrated pelvis and she's just doing so well. And part of that's a, f a function of her and, a tr and kind of a testament to her willpower. But it, it really has been quite a stunning recovery to see her go through that. And it's, she's one of the more remarkable stories and she really does bring that smile. About a year ago, I got to meet her daughter and her daughter came in and you start realizing what it's all about. Cause you see her daughter and you see what her look at her daughter. And now Sam's married and you know, all these functions and things. And she's talking about shoes and like I'm laughing cause she's sitting here talking to me about what type of heels she can wear. And I, at one point we were literally talking about whether or not she was going to be alive for her daughter's next birthday. Freak accident, riding a four wheeler. My bike apparently had a broken strut. I didn't, wasn't aware of it. I was driving down this gravel driveway and I left front tire hit a tuft of grass and it jerked the handlebars out of my hands. I flipped onto my left side and instead of putting my feet together, I crisscrossed them and shattered my whole entire tib tib. So Jamie had a compound tibia fracture, which meant the bone had come through the skin. And she was treated at an outside institution with a contemporary uh, surgical technique. I had a rod, screws, nails, clamps, all of the above in there. I was in the hospital for about three days. They sent me home. Five years later go by and just having a normal walk in the yard and I felt one of those clamps break. That entire five years I was in excruciating pain every day. I went to a local orthopedic doctor that next day, he did an immediate x-ray and he said, you're not leaving here without a referral to SLU. And that's how Dr. Watson came into play. So I was dealing with a leg that bone was infected and the bone wasn't healed. And we had a situation in order to get rid of the infection, we had to basically take out, much like you take out a tumor, we had to take out a fair amount of infected bone that wasn't healthy. When you remove bone, you have to replace the bone. And kind of standard techniques up until a number of years ago were bone grafts. You would harvest bone from the pelvis or some other area to another operation, replace the bone, stabilize the bone, hope that the bone healed. A lot of times it can be two or three bone grafts, four or five operations in total. And that was kind of the historical background for this type of a, of a problem. About 20 years ago, people started doing external fixators, devices on the outside of the leg. With these external devices, you could actually move bone down inside the leg to bridge these defects. It's a great technique, and I started doing that. I actually went to Russia to learn that in 1989. <clears throat> great technique, but the problem is you have this thing on the outside of your leg, which, you know, takes a lot of care, and it's cumbersome, and as you turn the device, it actually, like a cheese cutter, these little wires cut through the skin and move the bone down. So it does work very nicely. It's just that, you know, technology moves ahead. And so I was fortunate to be on a design team that came up with this uh, concept of uh, moving bone with a rod that goes inside the leg. So the same idea, it moves a segment of bone 
across the defect, but you don't have to have a, de a device on the outside of your leg. It, it runs by a magnet. These lengthen your leg, they can correct deformities, and they can, they can move bone down inside. And you can see they're, they're very magnetic. Uh, uh, basically, they're magnetic driven. Inside these nails is a small little magnet. And it's attached to a worm gear, much like a car jack. And so as you spin the magnet on the inside, it acts like a car jack and slowly distracts. You can see this tip will slowly go down like that. And you activate this with a device that you place on the outside of your leg. It's, it's like a Campbell's soup cans, only mod modern. And you push the button and these two big magnets in the Campbell's soup cans go round and round and round. And they actually spin the magnet inside this nail, which then causes this to distract. So the patient just puts the device on their leg, clicks the button three times a day, and within 24 hours, it'll lengthen one millimeter. So it takes about seven minutes every time you do this. A little time consuming, but basically you do it three times a day and you gain one millimeter of height or you move the bone one millimeter. It takes a little bit of time. In her case, I think it took about 40 days because we had to transport the bone inside her leg of about four to five centimeters. So if you go at a millimeter a day, that's 40 days, 50 days. Then you say, well, okay, you move bone down what happens to that, where you moved it, what happens there? Well, that bone automatically fills in by itself. It's, it's analogous to pulling taffy. So we, we cut the bone, we make a fracture, we let the fracture start to heal, and then we actually grab that bone and pull it down to bridge the gap. And this, this early bone healing is like taffy. It kind of stretches, elongates, and then when we're done, it heals. So you don't need a bone graft for that, and you don't need a bone graft for the defect. So it's a nice way to, you know, move a lot of bone without extra surgery. So in her, well, first we had to clean out the area of infection. So we took out a section of bone, it was about four to five centimeters, and we filled that area with an antibiotic bone cement, which meant that it would sterilize that area. Once the area was sterilized, we then came back probably six weeks later and put the special rod down, cut the bone, and then Jamie, uh, after about, I think, seven to ten days, started with the pop cans, the soup cans, turning, turning the nail on the inside, and over the course of 40 to 50 days, she moved the bone down inside her leg. As I was operating this machine, it was, I didn't feel anything, you know. I heard it, I mean, it was very loud. When they showed me how to use it, they said, you know, keep your cell phones away, this is a big, large magnet. I placed it on my leg three, three times a day, and it spun this magnet, and it helped grow my bone. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. It was very, very amazing to watch because I had doctor's appointments every two weeks. And then uh, once the bone docked, once the segment crossed the defect site, you squeeze it together and eventually it heals and the bone up above also fills in. We'll show you some pictures where the bone looks just like it's normal bone. Pretty amazing to watch those x-rays every two weeks, you know, to see how it was just bringing it down and how the bone on the top was filling in. and. It was actually a pretty beautiful thing. But it sure beats having a device on the outside of your leg that you have to mess around with and it's cumbersome and it's painful. So it's a, it's a, it's a nice advancement for pretty significant problems. I'm glad that I was lucky enough to end up with him as my doctor. You can imagine if you're a short stature and you had a short leg and you, you cut the bone and then you use the magnet and this part lengthens. So the initial technology was for leg length, which of which I started to use and a couple other uh, surgeons and I were talking, why couldn't we use the same technology to move bone down inside legs rather than just lengthen? Why can't we use it to do the same thing, only move bone transport? We approached the company and <coughs> Uh, basically, they gave us pretty free reign, and this is, uh, you see, there's, there's, you might not be able to see this, but there's holes here. This little part moves down inside this rod. The rod doesn't gain any length, but this rod, this in, in, internal rod, moves up and down. So you can picture if you hook up a piece of bone to this, and then you activate it with a magnet, 
this can slide up and down. So it's an internal bone transport nail. So we didn't develop the, we didn't develop the technology. We just approached the company to utilize it in a different fashion, which they were more than happy to do. So it's, uh, it's nice when something actually works, you know. <laughs> I got a lot of ideas. Most of them not so good, but every once in a while you get lucky, and, and this turned out pretty good. All the, all the docs at SLU have the same issues. We all have these very complex problems, complex patients. Patients are really, they're kind of at the end of the line, basically. I mean, they've gone to other, other places and they haven't had uh, the successful outcomes that they desire. So I think the thing that, at least for me, that stimulates you know, innovation is the patients and their problems. We have all the technology we need. We have all 3D spins, we have all the O-arms, we have all the navigation stuff we need, which was totally, is totally new in last 10 years. So if he had the same issue back in the day, he would may not be having that cage because back in the day, people used to use their own bone. He would have had another surgery to just have that bone. So that is new. It's kind of interesting that in this short period of time, we're seeing this technology really grow and take off. There have been tumor surgeons who have been doing these surgeries for a long time with good results, but we are really able to kind of push the boundaries, push the margins, and really kind of test the limits of that using this, this tool. And you know, whether it's navigation, whether it's these 3D printing, and, and the better imaging quality and all that stuff, it really does make a difference. And you know, it's going to continue doing so in the future. We have gone down from like open surgeries to like keyhole surgeries to even endoscopic surgeries now. So I'm focusing that I should keep on innovating so that I get better and better every time. That's the goal. The institution kind of fosters creativity and really lets you take the ball and run with it. So, so that's, you know, that's a good feeling that you have the ability to uh, science out a problem and if you have a solution, you go for it. And the fact that the patients are able to come in, walk right across the hall, see me, see him, get all their care, go across the street, go across the building and get their infusions and all, I mean, it makes it easy on them. And that is really kind of what we've been building for, you know, the decade plus I've been here. I'm, I'm working on a few newer techniques, which is depending on AI. So I'm looking to utilize AI into imaging. And it really is a team approach. And it's not just, you know, it's not, just the surgeons, right? We have the medical oncology team, the radiation oncology. So it really is, I call it a sarcoma center. I believe SLU care physicians are different from other doctors. I felt a higher level of care, compassion, knowledge. The outcome is so much better than I ever thought it would be. We can get people up and walking and functional again. And, and that's, that's pretty rewarding. And plus it's, it's a lot of fun. And I love it. I love every day of it, so.